All right. Hello and welcome to our MDM webcast, which is titled How PIM Powers the Buying Experience, which is sponsored by CSS Commerce and Content Serve. I'm Mike Hockett, the executive editor of Modern Distribution Management and our website, mdm.com. And I want to thank you for participating in this call today. I'm going to serve as your moderator for today's 60 minute program, which is being recorded. And after this live event, we will send you a follow up link to watch again on demand or share however you would like. And I'd like to say right away that we do encourage everyone in our audience to ask questions at any time during this hour via the chat function. And the more, the merrier here. We'll have an audience Q&A segment later in this hour, but you don't need to wait until then to send in a question or a comment. And it's always great to get our audience's input during our webcasts. And we want to hear about your experience with product information management in your business. So feel free to make your voice heard here. Joining me today are three featured speakers who have a lot of expertise in this area. Here today is Brandon Snyder, who is the head of online, online customer experience at City Electric Supply, Alex Semerl, who is managing director at ContentServe, and Rob Newman, who is the chief, strat chief digital strategy and marketing officer at CSS Commerce. These three will offer a very nice combination of perspectives from Brandon, who already has nearly seven years of product content management experience at Allied Electronics and Automation, besides City Electric Supply, Rob and then Alex, who serves as who serve distributors and manufacturers with their PIM needs on a daily basis at CSS Commerce and Content Serve. Those three are going to present some PIM insights before we dive into a panel discussion. So, what are we talking about today, and why are we talking about this? You know, why is this a topic we need to explore? Well, over as we've seen over the past decade, and especially from 2020 onward, just Distributors are now hyper-focused on providing the best possible customer buying experience that they can, or at least the leading ones are. And this involves a lot more than just having the right product information in the right place. Today's buyers now expect personalized and accurate product content, no matter where their touch points are with your products. So the goal of this webcast is to show distributors how to create a comprehensive buying experience that reduces shopping cart cancellations, converts more customers and leads to incremental sales with greater efficiencies. And as you see as you see on screen here, here's a quick preview of some of the talking points we plan to cover today. And we might do these in kind of a various order here. One of them is what are our product information management goals? And what do they look like for different companies, whether that's different, you know, different markets, different sizes of companies. Uh, this this in distribution sector is so fragmented that PIM can look different for different companies, so we want to touch on that. We're also going to touch on what needs to be done to meet those goals. And there can be a more basic version, uh, kind of setting the stage, and there is a more complicated version that we'll be going over here. We'll be covering connecting things together with PIM management and how PIM enables different parts of the business to communicate with others and kind of unsilo those traditionally siloed operations. We're gonna to touch on what low hanging fruit there is in PIM. As with any technology, any data operation, one of the first questions is how do we get started? What's, you know, what are some easy wins we can find? We're gonna to touch on that on the PIM front. And then of course, there's the buy-in uh, you know, factor. It just, again, with any technology, any initiative, it doesn't go real far if you don't have executive and uh, buy-in and beyond with the rest of the company. So. We're definitely going to touch on the point of buy-in throughout the company. So that's a brief look at some of what we're going to talk about today. And with, with that, we're going to get things started with some quick introductions. And I already gave our speakers names and titles, but I do want to have each of them share just a bit about their background and experience with product information management. Uh, let's start with Brandon. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, I was with Allied and RS for seven years. And the last two years I've been been working at City Electric Supply. So I've started in the process of an old antiquated PIM into an upgrading of that very PIM and into something more of a homegrown um, version of what a PIM is and what it wants to be, right? So a lot of different experience throughout distribution in my career and uh, pretty excited to talk about it today. Thanks, Brandon. Let's go over to Rob. Uh, thank you. 
So um, I, I've been in this industry a long time and I actually started on the operations front in both manufacturing and distribution. Um, I've moved through software being both on the product side and now as an SI systems integrator, helping customers actually achieve the goals that they've set on implementing a thing, why and how. All right, and uh, last but not least, Alex, over to you. Thank you. Um, so firstly, it's a pleasure to be a part of the panel together with Rob and Brendan today. And thank you to Mike and to the rest of the MDM team for the excellent facilitation of the webinar so far. A bit about me, my name is Alexander Semerol. I've been with ContentServe for roughly five years. I'm responsible as managing director for the US, which means looking after our go-to-market strategy in terms of sales, marketing, um, operations and customer success. A little bit more about ContentServe, we're a leading PIM and DAM provider. We have roughly 20 years experience within the market. We cover three main regions, that's US, Europe, and JPAC. Um, and we have around 360 customers, both within the B2B and B2C segments globally. That's it for now. Thanks, Mike. All right, well, without further ado, we're going to dive into this discussion by, I'm gonna turn things over to Alex. Alex, it's all yours. Right, all right. Let me bring up my screen here. All right, maybe someone can just give me a thumbs up once yeah. they're able to see it. Perfect. Thanks so much, Mike. Um, today, what we'd like to discuss and share more about is the fundamental shift in buyer's experiences and how PIM can play a vital role within this transformation. How certain conditions from our past, you know, with COVID, supply chain issues with materials, hampered logistics, higher costs of shipping goods, to name just a few, have led us to where we are today and how these factors have, and I think will continue to transform the buyer experience within the manufacturing and distribution fields. Now, I'm really happy to share some of our learnings and experiences together with Rob and Brandon, and we'd love for you, our participants as well, to really engage with us, and please do ask any questions in the chat as well. All right, to start off with, um, we first actually had a question to you. Um, so this is a question pertaining to the shopping experience within the B2B field. Um, when we were putting together these slides, uh, I have to say I was really surprised by this statistic, especially how impactful this can be for buyers in the B2B industry. Now, the question is, how many customers in B2B expect a personalized shopping experience? Options that we have is 20, 40, and 70%. What's meant here by personalized shopping experience is any initiative available to tailor the buying journey toward a specific customer. As I said, we'd really love for you to share your thoughts regarding one of the above numbers. Mike, were we able to send out that poll? Yeah, we're ready. Uh, the results are coming in right now. Uh, we'll keep it up for okay. about another 20, maybe 30 seconds. But uh, yeah, we already got over about a couple dozen responses, so we'll see um, just how many we get. But yeah, we'd love everyone to vote on this if they're if they would like to. Please, yeah, that would be fantastic. Um, Rob, Brendan, were your expectations moved in any way towards any of these? Yeah, three options? no, I was thinking about seventy percent. You know, would probably be on the light end, uh, maybe closer to a hundred, if it was possible. Mm. Mm. Well, I think you know, based on who's running you know, uh, distribution, um, I think it may be a surprising answer uh, to, to some, right? Because B2B, we've always been very factual, down to earth, particularly in, in distribution. But I think folks have caught on. <laughs> so that's a great answer to the poll. But go ahead, Alex. Yeah, and I see that that's also reflected in the poll. So 23 out of 30 participants actually went for 70%. And if I go over to the next slide, um, that's indeed reflected in the results. So this was a study which was performed by Forrester. It was actually really, really eye-opening for us um, because there's a clear distinction between the current expectations of B2B customers and the actual reality of what is being offered today. So this was a study conducted with roughly 1,000 businesses, and their customers, of course, were surveyed as well. 
in that study, 73% of B2B customers expected a personalized shopping experience. Now the delta or the gap is that currently only 22% of B2B customers have indicated that their last online experience was personalized and tailored to the extent with which they were actually happy with. So I think a real opportunity here for these businesses to hone in on potentially. Now, it's also important to mention that B2B buyer expectations are consistently changing. I don't think there's any real point or topic that our panel will be able to outline today that is leading to this. Realistically, I think it's a combination of events and factors, not least to say that you know, B2B buyers are expecting the same level of service and quality as with their other online purchases, you know, making it easy, seamless, maybe traceable and transparent, what type of product they're buying, the product details, and being able to find the right information quickly without losing time. So if we look to the left side of the screen here, an important foundation from the past is being able to sell your products online as a minimum. Yeah, we know that COVID was a catalyst for this happening. Having more content available online and offering that content in an omni-channel way or a fully integrated shopping experience across all touch points, you know, whether that's your brick or mortar stores online or via mobile apps. If we shift to the right-hand side and we move over to today, my view is that buyers are expecting a more loyal, consistent experience, which the business is offering them via the purchase journey, both pre and post purchase as well. Um, I think certain content which is contextualized will be crucial as a differentiator here for businesses to be able to identify and offer specific product bundles for return customers or reoccurring buyers that reflect their original purchase. I think there's also been a shift from selling products as you know, individual SKUs or objects available online to actually offering a full service solution in terms of better understanding and profiling the buyer, their industry, their product requirements and tailoring the purchase experience based on that. So what we wanted to do here was to outline a few factors which our participants today or businesses even within the distribution area may be experiencing. Now, the reason why we wanted to include some of these questions is it can help articulate a few of the pains and challenges our customers experienced in the past, several of which may resonate with some of our participants today. And I think for brands and retailers which are product oriented, being able to have confidence in managing their product data, content and digital assets is really key, especially as it serves as the foundation for the interaction with the respective customer. What we've seen is that there can also be a whole host of different systems and processes which can cost a business a significant amount of time and effort to try to manage, especially if this is in a defragmented structure using multiple legacy systems, you know, whether that's Excel-based, different forms of data pools or data lakes. For many businesses in the B2B space as well, focusing on providing more content and products to marketplaces um, like Amazon, Google Manufacturing Center, uh, will be a key element to introduce or to reinforce in the future. Buyers at the end of the day are, I think, starting to expect products to be available on marketplaces like these. So content syndication will be an important element here in the future. And I think having your data in order is also a key differentiator in overcoming certain market challenges that we've outlined here at the bottom of this slide. Whether that's the emergence of low-cost competitors, where we know product data is unique selling proposition, um, improving scalability of products across all channels, or improving rates of internal collaboration between teams, right? So from product conception to enrichment and to go to market, these are also going to be key factors. And what we wanted to do here was to include a few different elements of what delivering a strong customer experience can entail, whether your business is in distribution or manufacturing. What's important, I think, to mention here is that there's typically always a combination of factors which businesses can work to incorporate consistently and sustainably to, for their customers to experience a great purchase journey. And I think an absolute bedrock in delivering an excellent customer experience is to work and operate with accurate and rich product content and assets. This will help ensure your customers can purchase with confidence, and you can also leverage rich product content to illustrate relatively complex product features. 
ensuring that data is also available across all channels with the same level of accuracy or consistency in terms of product messaging will make it easier to consume for buyers and distribute this information more seamlessly. What's also an important point here to mention, I think, is that for any initiative that a company can be planning for, it's really important to have stakeholder buying. What I mean by this is having a shared or joint vision across your team or department with clearly outlined objectives of what you would like to achieve in the future and using that as a starting point to work backwards and dictate what are the steps that need to take place in order for us to reach those objectives. You know, whether that's in terms of system requirements, landscape architecture, or other milestones. That's also a great way of building up a business case within a company to adopt new solutions. So start at the outcome of what you'd like to achieve. Brandon, Rob, what are your thoughts here, guys? Well, I wanted to build on what you said about, um, you know, experience loyalty. And I, mm -hmm. one of the things I want to do is, you know, as, as a consultant in this industry, what are some of the cases? Uh, we've got a case we call SKU by store that has completely changed the sales process for this client. Um, and it's, and I'll get into it a little bit in, in when we start talking about cases, but the salespeople love it because customers become so loyal and love the way they're able to buy. It actually has changed their onboarding of new customers. They're accelerating sales because PIM enables that kind of rich product data and complex buying, right? B2B mm -hmm. is way more complex purchase process than a rack of clothing, right? So many more SKUs, so much going on. And I think what your point is around experience is absolutely correct. Mm. Yeah, it can Building further, you know, when you start talking about the actual data that's coming through a PIM, it, it means something different to each one of your customers. And my customer might be different than your customer, and, and your customer might be different from another one of your customers. It has to be tailored, it has to be curated, and it has to be powerful, or it's just data. If it's just data, it, it's not it's not going to create that conversion of an add to cart, of a downloading of a, of a diagram that you need, you know, to to make your products, you know, be more viable and differentiate yourself from another distributor or another salesperson and bridging that gap between the B2C, you know, reality that people live in and into the B2B world, your customers either wanted that at one point, they want it now, or they're going to want it, right? This isn't a, a you know, one-stop shop all. You have to keep building that conversation. You have to learn what it means um, to make it successful. And, uh, you know, this customer experience is not just a, hey, content, data, you know, videos, images. It, it's not just that. It's it's the whole journey, right? And and it's it's really hard to make that powerful without the proper pimp that meets that meets your needs. Right? Mm. That's also a good point, Brenda, that you raised with transforming data or taking the data and turning it into useful information that the business can actually utilize. Yeah. All right. Well. If we're now looking towards what are some of the key benefits derived by your customers, you know, um, firstly, being able to gain access to and consume more accurate, consistent product data is going to be a gold standard for any customer. I think it goes beyond just having the necessary information available and actually making sure that you can incorporate your product data, content, assets as a key differentiator and unique selling proposition, as Brendan mentioned earlier with the journey. Secondly, when we're talking about product transparency here, this reflects more so the ability of a company to be able to deliver the necessary visibility of their product offering to consumers across all channels. Now, within the distribution and manufacturing industries, this can take quite a few different forms. I mean, just a few examples can be having clear and concise ingredient lists right on your safety data sheets, making sure that all of your raw resources or raw materials are disclosed on certifications and so on. Um, so this ties into instilling higher purchase confidence for your customers, which will allow you to build up that experience loyalty that Rob mentioned earlier and generate repeat buyers. The ability for consumers to also transact across all of a company's channels is critical 
basically the alternative is that the business is potentially losing out on additional revenue streams by not offering the ability to transact across certain channels. These factors all culminate in driving a frictionless buyer process, one in which companies can deliver a strong competitive advantage using data with products, content, and assets. Now, what are some of the key benefits derived for your business? I think this can have really significant value to different teams, different stakeholders within your companies. Operating with more accurate and rich product data will without a doubt significantly contribute towards stronger revenue generation. And at the end of the day, be able to equip your internal sales, uh, marketing, inside sales teams with sharper marketing materials, catalogs, which they can use in customer facing settings. With that, also comes the ability to determine, analyze, report on the quality and completeness of your data, ensure language translations are made effectively, and lower the overall amount of time needed to send your products out to market. This can also significantly reduce your product returns and reduce the risk that your customers would leave to different competitors on the market. The element of also being able to create bundles of relevant products or recommend products based on last purchases can reveal further upselling or cross-selling opportunities, which your business may not have even considered in the past um, to that customer. What I think is also noteworthy to mention here on this slide is the improved facilitation within your ecosystem specifically with potential suppliers. So if your business is working with suppliers, you're receiving data of some kind from your supplier base, you know, whether that's a product content, digital assets, data in CSV or Excel file formats, being able to set up, review that data for data quality checks, completeness prior to its acceptance can really benefit both parties and have a significant savings in terms of time and costs. At the end of the day, these benefits will definitely have strong top line uh, benefits, but also bottom line to reduce the bottom line costs. I think what's critical also to understand is the ability for business to have trust in the data they work and operate with, which will have very long standing positive impacts across different departments and different teams. That was a short overview. Guys, um, so I really wanted to thank you for listening into this portion of the slides. I hope that proved insightful, useful, and maybe offered a fresh perspective regarding how the buyer experience is changing and what you can do to help support your customers. Um, Mike, I believe I'm going to hand it back over to you. All right. Yeah, I think I just need you to end your screen share, and then I will start mine. All right. Uh, Rob, I'm going to hand things off to you to take us from here. Thanks so much. What I'd like to do is cover the three biggest questions we get asked, right? Um, once you've made the decision that a PIM is right for you and how do you actually, um, and how do we respond to that and, and, um, and sprinkle it with a little bit of, uh, of salt and pepper around, uh, around what we've found with uh, various customers. Um, you know, a little background about our, our company is the, the reason we've got the experience, we specialize uh, in B2B distribution. Uh, distributors are 90% of my business. And it's, it's, you know, we're very focused on it. And, um, you know, they may be incredibly um, simple uh, or, or everyday products, but there's a lot of them. So we tend toward complex uh, products, you know, lots of SKUs, complex assemblies, and th that's our business. So here's, here's what the, the customers ask us. Slide. Okay. What's, what's the reason why I should look at a PIM? What, what is it that I'm really trying to do? And, and here's, Here's why, right? People don't usually change unless there's a problem. <laughs> and so most of our customers actually come to us either to redo work, unfortunately, or to fix things that they've encountered, often by not having a PIM, right? Trying to load your e-commerce with a million SKUs um, will, will drag your system to a grinding halt, honestly. Um, the effort 
connection, by effort, I mean the hours of management, the ability to create connection around what you need to deliver. Um, we had a customer come to us with load times on their site in excess of five seconds, and that's being generous when they put up all their, all their products and therefore speed, right? People, people still do, and we saw 70% are looking for a, a real experience. Well, speed is actually the most basic part of your experience and mobile is everywhere. So a heavily loaded e-commerce site that's crawling or the inability to display their products. That is often why folks approach us and ask for our help, number one. Now, we have a few innovative customers that have come to us and said, you know what, what we want to do is automate the entire process and get people out of it. Most of the time, unfortunately, the real reason is you've got problems. Second slide. Okay, what is the biggest challenge, right? And it's a challenge for, for us, right? When asked to put in a PIM system all kinds of problems. You start peeling that onion back and you get all kinds of things that you begin to realize. One of which is, right, your ERP, limited to 160 characters in some cases, that's not a description. <laughs> uh, you know, pulling in information and photos and drawings and 3D views coming from multiple places. But the real thing is the hierarchy of your data. Right, being able to run my parts business, my replacement business, my service business, and all of the assemblies, the descriptions and hierarchy are often not as well cre um, defined as they need to be. Now you can display a product, but can I actually build a bill of material on your site? Can I actually um, allow an order that's standard or ask for custom features or identify, I have this product, but I just need this one part. That's where a PIM excels. And I can show you drawings of it. I can allow you to modify it. You know, we're, we're gonna talk a lot of really great things coming, but this is the most important thing. And you hear it over and over, data, 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 but it's true right? That is what we do. And in some cases, right, we do it iteratively. We'll start with what you have, implement the PIM, but we still wind up going back and working on the hierarchy or coming in behind another team. Mm -hmm. And because of our MDM expertise, begin to rebuild a hierarchy for a client. Next slide. Okay. What's the best results achieved? This is not typical. <laughs> um, when it's really bad, <laughs> um, you can have incredible uh, results, right? So when we took um, one of our case studies um, and, and are happy to share it, right? Um, that had incredible blockages to doing business online. And it had everything to do with um, supply visibility. Do I actually have it in inventory, right? Because I've got multiple warehouses and I'm ordering across multiple channels. PIM really can help with that. Um, how fast can I order? Can I actually do it mobile? And what are the related parts and sales actually putting together alternative and complementary items? We achieved... 30% actually winds up being $30 million in a month. Um, the ROI, we did not charge nearly enough. But, but, um, but for a $30 million one month incremental change, right, unleash this torrent of built up demand that they knew they had, and in some cases were achieving, but were completely overwhelmed with their salespeople and completely overwhelmed with systems that just couldn't handle it. That's the best results we've ever achieved. More typical, right, is you will see 
um, a lift in sales. You'll see a decrease in labor to handle your e-commerce and you will free up your salespeople from being order takers, which they often are, into prospectors where they're getting you new business. But here's some other ideas of benefits we've encountered, right? The most common is someone will come to us and say, I've got over a million, I've got 2.2 million SKUs and I want them on my website because no one knows I have them, right? We, we do this major catalog effort in which you can scroll, but how do I get 2.2 million SKUs onto a website? Tim allows you to create those kinds of relationships and on demand create um, a better capability of managing that many SKUs, managing the parts replacement business. So we had a customer whose parts, right, were only 10% of their business, but they knew it should be one of their largest. We took over time in two years, they went from that being 10% of their business to 25% by capturing more of an OEM market. Enhanced product data will allow you to do better sales. As I said, your conversion online. So let me talk about SKU by store for a second. We have a, a client um, who sells cell phone um, cases, uh, everything but the cell phone, from cases to glass to accessories. And they sell it for a variety of customers and primarily, they just started with the independents, 100 stores there, 50 stores there. By changing the buying process where a single corporate buyer could buy for 100 stores in a single shopping cart experience, which takes a lot of effort, buyers spend a day doing these things, not a click and buy. But allowing them to do what? We optimize their, their shipping costs. We show them if they buy a certain number of more items, they reduce, they, they get the better price break. And with those kinds of features and making it far simpler in the buying process, the PIM allows them to actually go get more customers. And now they're on onboarding the big boys, right? Verizon and T-Mobile just came on to our customer is, is SCP and they, they'll verify everything I just said. And then we've got some simple folks in the farm industry and believe it or not, the farm industry still creates catalogs. Distributors of large equipment um, create these massive catalogs. How do you manage that? Um, typically laying out a catalog will take a month, um, potentially more between placing all the pictures and everything, PIMS will allow you essentially to output catalogs, white label your products, change from B2B only to we have a client that's now created a consumer white label product uh, website. It allows you to manage your data, your photos, your um, uh entire information faster, cheaper, and easier, which allows you to expand in ways you really haven't had the opportunity to do before. Those are a few examples of way, innovative ways that our clients have, have taken advantage of the tremendous features of PIN. That's my, sh my sharing for now, unless we've got questions or ideas. We we really do welcome your questions, right? It spurs us to think better and, and to actually be specific to what you're looking for, right? And the great thing is you've got, um, you've got the, the guy who actually does it in, uh, in, for, the real, for the real deal at City Electric. You've got um, software expert and then the guy left holding the bag to implement it <laughs> and do it well. All right. Uh, yeah, indeed. Uh, you know, thank you, Alex and Rob, for that presentation. Uh, obviously, a lot of ground to cover here. But yeah, I love that you guys kind of hit on some of these key questions that, you know, anyone interested in PIM would have to know. And uh, thanks to Brandon for your insights along the way. And 
as Rob said, at this point, uh, we're going to continue this discussion by shifting to you know a panel discussion and an audience Q&A. That way, the speakers can share more insights in a more uh, free-flowing format here. But before I do, uh, like Rob alluded to, we definitely want to remind our audience that you can submit a question at any time or comment uh, via that, that Q&A function. And I'm sure that these three are up to the challenge of answering almost anything you can throw at them. So uh, we're going to start out here going back to a point that you guys made earlier uh, in the presentation here. You know, when you talked about what are the the key indicators that tell a company whether or not they need a P, a, a PIM, whether they not need to start using one, and you know the common reasons for getting one. So I know you guys. Uh, I don't want to make you rehash what you just uh, covered, but anything else that you can say on you know what some of these common indicators are, or these you know these these red flags that tell a distributor we really need to be using a PIM, and whoever wants to take that can go ahead. Well, I'd love yeah. Brandon. Why did, <laughs> what drove you to do it in the first place? Yeah, I, I think I think that the knowing why you need a pen has always got to be the first step, right? Um, and and a lot of times that will start with education and you're going to need some buy-in from someone internal in an organization to understand the value because like, like you said, you know, you can throw an Excel file or an FTP, you can, you can call to it, you can get this basic basicality done to where they can still transact on a product online, but you're missing out on everything that you guys went through and the, the personalization and, and, and creating those conversions even faster. Uh, a, a lot of people will say, hey, uh, an image is not gonna you know, make the sale for you. Having a great image on this, this site is not gonna make this, this high conversion and make this great sale, but it will absolutely prevent a sale, <laughs> right? So you, you start talking about, um, you know, blockage, and that's what content can be. Uh, having a blank image, having a terrible description, like you talked about, a 160 character or an 80 character or a 20 character description that's off of a price file is oftentimes not going to even get traffic to your site, let alone a conversion. And oftentimes you'll realize that your biggest web traffic conversions are those buyers that are going from a list of, a, of part numbers and, and you happen to be you know, selling them, but you're selling them because they're a part number, right? And the content's not bringing, bringing that traffic there. So, you know, understanding that, that that's, you know, a, a need it, it, is, is a big, big time, but also the education piece, everyone has to understand it or they're going to just think it's just another fancy tool and not a necessity, right? Any follow up there? Well, I, I think Brandon makes, you know, the, the, the perfect point around every customer, right? Everyone who wants to, um, to, to do a PIM, right? They're thinking through what the business case is, right? And a lot of times we get asked to help with that, right? What is the business? What am I actually going to get by investing this money and this time? And, and let's not kid ourselves. They're major projects, right? Typically, Right, a brand new PIM um, will take four months to 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 put together. More advanced, right? And you're not done there. You're right. You'll come back, and we usually call it a fast follow-on post-launch, right? So you need a business case. You understand. You need to understand what am I trying to accomplish, and how will this improve my internal processes and af affect my my revenue. Right, my my cost structure and my revenue, and that's that's where PIM shines, right? In many ways, um, that uh, that there's a variety of ways to do it. And and I'm going to take a quick moment to say, on a follow up, we have a PIM ROI um, spreadsheet calculator, and I'm I'm happy to share it with those who want it. All right. Uh, I'm going to bring just, in an audience question here. And, and Wes, sorry, was there any more follow up there? No, maybe yeah. just to add on, Mike, as well. I mean, from my perspective, it would involve three main elements. That's costs, which are lowered as a result. So in terms of reducing the amount of systems, reducing the amount of resources that need to work on enriching these files manually. And um, the time which is saved 
in terms of how many employees can be shifted away from Excel files and the process which Rob talked about to actually working within a PIM system, automating using workflows as an example to push data through out to the market. And finally, the additional revenue that's generated as a result. Yeah. And there are upselling, cross-selling opportunities that are there. And being able to turn data into information using a PIM system is a very, very effective method of that. All right. I'm going to bring in a question from Robin, who says, or just ask, can you talk more about hierarchy? And Rob, during your uh, your slides, you uh, talked about hierarchy and kind of how that works. Can you just expand on that a little more? Sure. So in setting up a PIM system, right, and, and any data, right, if you have an assembly, right, an assembly is made up of a series of parts. Um, they may be kitted, kits. Uh, and assemblies, right, could go into a group of, uh, of products, right? So first of all, understanding your products, that's your top hierarchy. Second, what are the assemblies and parts that need to go into that? And are there bundles, right? So related products, one of the most complex things or the things not necessarily, um, not, not so much complex, but you know, rarely put together is what are the complementary things I sell? If you buy this, <laughs> here's the replacement parts that you might need. Here's the um, uh, here uh, connecting it to your service uh, capability that says, look, typically here's the lifespan of that. These are the parts. Here's the assemblies. You might consider this product, right, because it bolts on. That's one level. And then below that, in order to allow someone, so we have a, a customer CTI, and I love everyone has a uh, <laughs> an acronym when you're when you're a uh, when you're a company. But they actually allow, right? We've built a bomb builder. So you you actually take, you can start from the top or you can start from from the bottom that says, these are the things I need. So how do I actually build that bill of material? Well, I start with the product I want. Here's the options that go into that. Here's the set of parts or the set of key features I want. And then we go grab, right? What are the actual assemblies, parts, kits that make up that options that they want to put together? And that provides a either configurable product that we can price automatically, right? With a set of rules or kick it back for a custom quote, if that's your business. That's where hierarchy is a benefit. And in some cases, right, there are six, seven levels deep. Happy, I think we have a white paper on that. Um, if not, I'm sure we have a, a, a video somewhere. My marketing department makes me do a lot of video. <laughs> <laughs> It's good stuff. And, and uh, we're getting some great audience questions here and yeah, you know, keep them coming. We're going to try to get through it as many as we can here. Um, mm -hmm. One question uh, it, it could be considered a complicated question, but I'm going to get through it as best I can here. Uh, Josh asked, we operate in a secondary market where items are mostly sold at the serial number level versus the SKU level. We are exploring PIM solutions, but we are hitting roadblocks given PIM's SKU level design. Any thoughts on how to begin addressing this issue or suggesting specific PIM software that might be a good fit? So whoever wants to take that, uh, anyone want to take a swing at that one? I'll do it. And then I think, well, actually, we all should. But real quickly, right, we're not trying to say content serve in this uh, webinar. We're talking generally, but I do, um, yeah. content serve. Uh, but, <laughs> uh, but that said, Right, we have a customer marks. They're in the plumbing industry, over a million SKUs. They sell, they sell multiple brands, right? From Kohler on to OEM businesses. And in a secondary market, right? The most, this is where data hierarchy comes in once again. Relating SKU from the manufacturer, SKU from a distributor, common names, all can be done. This is where you do need a PIM. And all of those relationships are perfectly kept in a PIM. And since you asked about a product, let me tee that up to Alexander to talk about how you do that in content server. 
Mm -hmm. So setting up a data hierarchy is flexible. It goes back to what Rob was saying in understanding your products. If you are working with serial numbers instead of SKUs, we also have a customer, Gorman Rupp, out of Southern Illinois. They're working with multiple brands. And the way that they set up the hierarchy there is to be able to include, let's say, a parent level with multiple different serial numbers of products below that. So I think once you have the right PIM system, it's not so much about setting up the hierarchy that's going to be a problem. It's more about understanding how you would like that to be set up and what's the most efficient process to be able to manage within content serve or any other pin that's available. Brandon, do you want to also share your thoughts from your perspective? Yeah, I mean, you, you guys could obviously speak better to this, but from, from our side, you know, when you sell a wire, <laughs> right? Mm. You, you're selling it by the foot over and over and over again for that same skew, right? Um, and being able to differentiate that through hierarchy through a different color, through a different material, it, it becomes necessary or, or you can send the wrong wire to a, to a customer and then pull the job and you be out, you know, $30,000 in labor costs, right? So the, the thing, the thing comes, comes full circle when you're talking about hierarchy for a lot of these questions that I see in the Q&A is establishing what that hierarchy is all out of the gate and then adjusting it where you need to because the benefits are just, they, they, you won't even know the benefits until you have them when a marketing piece needs to call on just a series of products rather than a list of 100 SKUs that you give them, right? Um, it, it becomes more powerful and, it, and it, like I said, it touches on a lot of the questions that I'm reading through right now. Uh, and, and a PIM is gonna be the, your, your into the hierarchy status, right? Let, let me follow up, right? It, it just occurred to me, we do have a customer that sells by serial number. They're in the firearms industry. So the ATF controls, right? Every single, every single serial number has to be accounted for. And what um, uh, Alex just talked about in terms of that capability, just like his customer, um, that's, that is an area again, where you want to have a PIM it is about that hierarchy. He's 100% correct, but you can sell by serial number, no problem. Uh, one question I'm very curious to get your guys, uh, you know, your just your perspectives on is AI. And we keep hearing about how automation, you know, there's all these different areas of business automation, whether it's in sales order entry or, uh, I don't know, just order taking entry, just a lot of these different back office automation uh, capabilities. And one person asked, you know, is AI involved with PIM or coming soon? So uh, I don't know which order we want to go in here, but yeah, I'd be curious to, to know what is the current level of automation uh, in the PIM world and what does the runway look like for that? Maybe I can take that question initially, Mike. Um, I think there's a few different components to this. In one sense, I, already, I would say that AI has already been integrated into PIM systems, certain PIM systems in, in some capacity. And I think we can break it down to a few different levels. One is channel analytics. So being able to understand how well products perform and what are some of the recommendations that would be suggested back to product managers is very, very insightful and useful information. Two, contextualization. So being able to identify profile consumers that are visiting your website and match those with potential products or bundles of your products is definitely an area that's also, I think, going to be elaborated more in the future and will leverage AI even more so. And finally, the third, as I think everyone here on the panel has seen and all the participants is with the um, emergence of ChatGPT and I think barred from Google just a few days ago, incorporating certain elements of artificial intelligence chat within the PIN system. So if a product manager is checking, hey, which products have been rejected within a certain state of workflow, that ChatGPT can immediately give them a, um, a response back and let them know where that product is or where is the holdup currently within the PIM system. Rob, would you also agree? Do you see different use cases there? Yeah, let me give a couple of outside the PIM mm. AI, but it, it's really about PIM, right? First is one of the key items about, um, about PIM is, right, enhancing your descriptions. If you're pulling things from an ERP or a very limited and boring description to clients, right, AI allows us to go and find related descriptions, look at your manufacturer descriptions, and actually enhance your descriptions um, 
really effectively. It's reduced that time for us immensely. And then the second is search. Search is one of the most important revenue pieces on an e-commerce website. While not the purpose here, AI-driven search has to have something to go search. It searches your PIM system. Uh, Brandon, any any your perspective on you know how either City Electric is using supply or just how you've seen it apply to PIM you know in the past or right now? Yeah, AI is a is a is a dirty word, right? Uh, for for a lot of a lot of us and a lot of what we're doing, but it doesn't have to be. You know, if you break it down to a very small uh, detail of what your customer might need, um, with like you said, that data that it's searching could be your PIM, and as that data has to be clean for the the AI to work properly, right? Yeah. So when you have a customer and you talk about personalization, and they, they log into their account and they've made the same search 10 times and they clicked on the fourth result eight times, that result moves to the top. You know, that, that that's not gonna be possible without AI, without yeah. a process that's like from Alex's or, or Rob's, what they've worked through in the past, but the data has to be clean and the hierarchy has to be clean for that to be possible. But it, it, it helps personalization and it helps everything that, that we've talked about. It just you just have to embrace it and kind of and figure out how to use it. And the only way to do that is to, to figure out what your customer needs. And a lot of that data is being stored that way. All right, good stuff. Um, I'm going to bring in. Uh, I think it'd be pronounced Kareen, uh, who asked, "Can you tell uh, can you tell more about the capability of cross selling or upselling and how that works in the PIM?" So. Uh, Rob, I'll pitch this to you first. Just uh, any thoughts there on, you know, cross-selling, upselling functionality in PIM? Yeah, and I'd, I'd love to hear, you know, what, what Brandon uh, has to say about it. But this is a lot of, you know, the implementation of a PIM. What are you trying to accomplish, right? That's kind of where I sit in delivering the results. Um, the, the, the simple answer is uh, cross-selling being able to understand what is bought and what else is complementary to buy. Uh, if I buy this, I need that. You know, let's, let's think about Amazon, right? There's always a list of here's stuff you might consider with it. We do that um, and it takes a PIM to do it and we combine it with search technology when we implement it, right? There's many ways to do it, but I think the, the upsell capability, right? or a capability actually of understanding what's your margin. So um, with Marks, right, we created an understanding of combining what's my actual margin on the Kohler versus my OEM, right? Now my OEM product is actually cheaper, but Marks makes a much bigger margin, right? So we always display that. The highest margin product is always displayed next to what they specifically ask for, right? I specifically asked for a Kohler faucet. Here's your Kohler faucet. Have you considered this slightly cheaper but more profitable product for us? Those are the kinds of things that work. Um, the other thing is if you're doing omni-channel, right? The same thing, that same data has to be loaded into your marketplace and really the only way to manage it effectively across multiple uh, places as a pen. Uh, Brandon or uh, Alex, any thoughts uh, additionally about cross-selling or upselling? Yeah, it's it's one of the key levers you pull in e-commerce, right? You know, tr page traffic, conversion, and average order value, right? A average order value is is always kind of looked at as the third version of, of what you need to do to increase sales, but after, but it's it's a common thing that Amazon does really well in the B two C space, like like Rob mentioned. I have a golf club in my in my cart. It's telling me the golf balls and the, the golf club that I need to go with it that I didn't know I needed, right? And they had a sell already, but they increased the average order value by putting in a nice little package. Would not be able to do that without robust PIM with enriched data and, and, and being you know up at the forefront of that technology. You can't do that with an Excel file, no matter how, how good you, you guys are in Excel. It's, a, it's, a, it's necessary to have a PIM to do that. Uh, I, I think you guys may have, uh, or Alex, I wasn't sure if you had anything there. I mean, maybe just to add on regarding cross-selling and upselling, 
cross-selling is essentially tying product bundles to already what's been bought, right? And saying, all right, here's a list of products that would be applicable towards the purchase that you've already made. Um, this can be managed within a PIM system relatively easily by just creating a bundle around the parent, let's say. Um, if we're talking about upselling, this is a little bit different, right? Because it's a new opportunity to sell something to a customer which may not have previously been aware of that product. So it could come back to contextualization a little bit and identifying what that product or what the correct product would be to present to that customer at that time. Um, I think it piggybacks off a little bit what Rob was saying earlier on. And I'll, uh, Rob, I'll, I'll build sorry, one more quick thing, right? Mm -hmm. It uses the PIM, but here's how you get creative, right? So we did a Salesforce implementation for a client with a PIM, right? In which we also understand inside the CRM, what is your service requirements for the product you just bought? Right, so now we have in a CRM, we know the customer, we know the service requirement, and we can go back and, you know, instead of bloating up the CRM with product data and all the rest, we go and on that timely basis, we go look at, here's the timing, what's the current most up-to-date product that we can deliver via email or whatever and suggest, hey, it's that time, and here's the part, and here's you know, 5% off if you buy it now, right? Nothing to do with a PIM, but it's enabled by the PIM. And that is right. where you get tremendous marketing leverage, which is why when we're talking to folks, right, it's not just CIOs, it's the e-commerce, it's branded. <laughs> Actually, it's, that's who we're talking about, right? People with revenue responsibility is, yeah. is often our most important part of the, of the internal customers. Hmm. I'm going to get one more question here, if we can take this one quick. Uh, Alex asks, and you guys might have already touched on this earlier, how do you handle or market two similar items from different suppliers? And uh, he adds, I suppose this is a question about product representation. So uh, any of you guys want to take that one about, you know, handling two similar items from different suppliers? I mean, within, so if we're talking about supplier onboarding, um, both of those products would be managed in slightly different variations. So one supplier would be able to upload their own data set and a different supplier with maybe a similar product would have a different data set there. And when those, um, both of those sheets would be accepted or consumed into the main PIM system, they would have different um, characteristics and attributes and also a different SKU count as a result, whether that's a unique identifier, a serial code, whatever it might be. Yeah. So um, in practicality, that's the way that we could differentiate between those two products. Brendan, I, I know you wanted to add something there as well. Yeah, I was, I was going to say, it, it's depending on what your customer wants. Do they want three options for a product? Do they, are they brand specific? You know, are you trying to push your own brand, a, you know, an Amazon mm -hmm. basic brand or, or what? Um, but the more options the customer has to, to make the conversion, it, it's up to you. But it's very easy to distinguish that stuff in, in a PIM. I, All right. Quick, quick add. Yeah, go, go ahead. I, I'm so glad uh, Alex brought up, right? We've talked about PIM to e-commerce, PIM to e-commerce. PIM actually en enables the vendor portals, the management of vendors, and makes it a whole lot easier to get that information into your system. Um, we, we haven't talked about it, but uh, it's really important as well. Mm -hmm. All right, we did get one question just a second ago, and I think uh, someone else, and I, I thought you touched on it, Rob, earlier, but they do ask, what is the average implementation time of the PIM and what are the areas that should be involved? So as quick as you can, just any idea on the timeline there? Four to six months, um, right. typical, right? And, and as always, right, mm -hmm. it's due to customer pausing, <laughs> right? Sometimes we're ready to move, but we've got to work through it with the with the customer and then I see what are the areas you need marketing, e-commerce, um, you do need IT involvement, uh, a good project uh, manager, product managers. Um, those are the key stakeholders uh, in, in your company. And just to add to that, Mike, if I can, I think Rob absolutely said it to so four to six months roughly is the implementation time. I would, what we would always advise our potential customers to do is to sit down together with us, sit down with CSS Commerce, and let's do a scoping workshop to better understand your requirements, to deep dive into some of the challenges, the pain points that you're looking to alleviate. And that will help set up a really efficient blueprint for implementation to take place. 
All right. Well, that is all the time we're going to have here for Q&A. Uh, so that essentially wraps up our discussion here today on how PIM powers the buying experience. And um, yeah, thanks again to everyone in the audience. We yeah, we got a, a lot of great questions there uh, as we went along. So I would really want to thank you, Brandon, Rob, and Alex, for all of those insights. Uh, as we covered here, there is a lot of layers to efficient product information management. And while some aspects, aspects of this are certainly market specific, I think essentially everything you three covered here today can be applied by any distributor that has embraced online digital sales. So Brandon, Rob, and Alex, you guys covered a lot of ground here. Uh, real quick, I want to give you a chance to share any uh, real fast parting thoughts or last words with the audience on this topic. Uh, Brandon, to you, and just keep everything as short as we can. Yeah, of course. Quickly, the, the biggest thing is education internally. Uh, you have to get that taken care of before you can even start these conversations or you're just wasting everybody's time. And four to six months for a pin of the nation sounds great to me. I've uh, never seen it anywhere close to that, but it sounds awesome. Rob, over to you. Yeah, um, we do. Look, education is right. We have white papers and videos on the website. The ROI calculator we typically use in you know trying to work with a customer, but if you're interested in it, email me directly. If you're interested in some of the case studies, email me directly. We're happy, you know, this is what we share. So, and, um, but I'm happy to answer that directly and get you the right one instead of you perusing uh, a website full of stuff. All right, last but not least, over to Alex. Yeah, I mean, if you have identified PIM as a core project that you would like to utilize and to deploy, definitely get in touch with myself or with my team. I think the goal is to turn data, uh, weaponize that and turn it into useful information for your business. But as both Brandon and Brandon and Rob have said, it starts off with education, enablement, and bit of building up that business case internally. Um, if you do have any questions, please let us know. And Mike, I guess, thanks for hosting the session today. Sure thing. Well, excellent. Uh, great job by you three. And thanks again for sharing all of your insights and all your experience here today. Um, I'm just glad we could have this conversation with our audience and get them involved. So with that, I'd certainly like to thank CSS Commerce and ContentServe for their sponsorship of this program and everything that both organizations do to help the distribution sector with their PIM management and beyond. And of course, I wanna thank everyone in the audience, whether you watch this live or on demand. And like I mentioned in the intro, we will send a link to, an, to access a recording of this program, which you can feel free to share uh, you know, how, however you would like and with your colleagues. We certainly encourage that. So one more thanks all around. I hope you learned or gained some valuable insight from this webcast. And that concludes our program. Thanks for watching.